now we get to the time where we can look at the Word of God. And as I was thinking of what to bring to you this morning and, and praying and wondering, uh, this first Sunday of our national shutdown, what could I bring to you? And I thought perhaps, you know, maybe we should go to a text where we can uh, look at the character of God and be encouraged to trust him all, all the more fully during this global crisis. But then I thought, man, there could be a number of visitors online with us and they need to hear the gospel. They need to know the hope of the, the Lord Jesus Christ. And But then as I thought about it some more, my heart kept coming back to our current series through Colossians and our passage that we've been working our way through, Colossians chapter 3, verses 8 through 15. And if you may recall, we're only halfway through our passage. And, and I just thought this seems to be the right fit, not only because carrying on in our passage may help to bring a, a sort of bit of continuity to our current situation, which is really a lot of discontinuity going on around us. And certainly it's not just because I'm the kind of person that doesn't like to leave things unfinished, and we still have four verses to work our way through, but really it became apparent to me that this passage probably speaks to our situation more than we may realize. It may very well be that God's good providence has us in the very passage in the exact time so early into our time of self-isolation in order to equip us for a very important way of Christian living to prevent something that could happen during these times, these long hours of self-isolation with the same people. And that is to prevent, here it is, Cabin fever conflict. Cabin fever conflict. Now, you probably could guess what that means. Perhaps it's already begun to manifest in your home. Well, what is cabin fever conflict? Cabin fever is that irritability, that listlessness, boredom, grumpiness, impatience toward others that is a result of spending long, isolated hours with the same people. And when, when someone is struck with cabin fever, they begin to then infect others uh, by provoking them. And then that leads to conflict. And so you have cabin fever conflict. But unlike the coronavirus, cabin fever is not an actual physical contagious disease for which there is no current cure. No, cabin fever is actually a spiritual issue one that is actually altogether preventable. That is, if we're born again. If we've truly got the Spirit of God living inside us because we have a living and true relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the only way. It would be impossible otherwise to avoid the conflicts that occur because without Christ, all we are is sinful, fallen human beings. And we're going to do what sinful, fallen human beings do. But it doesn't have to be that. When we are true Christians, born again with the Spirit of God living inside of us, and if we walk according to the Spirit, we will not carry out the lusts and desires of the flesh. And if we walk according to the Spirit-inspired principles that we see here in our very text, well, Kevin, fever conflict can be avoided altogether. What do we see here? These principles really are just applications of the lordship of Christ and the sufficiency of his salvation applied to the area of interpersonal relationships and conflict. See, when we apply the realities that if we're new creatures in Christ and we apply that to our relationships, we see that we are to remove all the vices that cause relational rifts and instead replace them with the godly virtues that are more reflective of the new creatures that we become in Christ. And those virtues will help not only prevent conflict, but also restore and build relationships. So with that in mind, let's read the passage. Follow with me in your Bible, Colossians 3, beginning at verse 8. But now, he says, you also put them all aside, anger, wrath, malice, slander, and abusive speech from your mouth. 
Do not lie to one another. Since you have laid aside the old self with its evil practices, and you have put on the new self who is being renewed to a true knowledge according to the image of the one who created him, a renewal in which there is no distinction between Greek and Jew, circumcised and uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave and free man, but Christ is all and in all. So, as those who have been chosen of God, holy and beloved, put on a heart of compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience, bearing with one another and forgiving each other, Whoever has a complaint against anyone, just as the Lord forgave you, so also should you. Beyond all these things, put on love, which is the perfect bond of unity. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called in one body. And be thankful. Well, these principles have particular application to church life. That's why the focus is on one another, each other, one body. But it is a fact of life, isn't it? That if we live out these principles at home, we certainly will be able to live them out in the local church. Just as it is easier to go from the greater to the lesser, so it is easier to live out these principles toward those we only spend part of our week with, but the true test of character is how we live out these virtues towards those we live with every day. Now, in this passage so far, we've seen the what, why, what. What we are to put off, the vices we are to put off, why we are to do all this, and then what virtues we are to put on. We saw that the vices that we're to put off are like dirty old clothes that no longer are appropriate for who we are in Christ. They need to be just taken off, thrown away for good. They have no place in our life anymore. These vices include the relationship-destroying attitudes of inward and outward kinds of sinful anger, anger, wrath, malice, and also the relationship-destroying words like slander and abusive speech and lying. Those need to be put off like dirty old clothes. And the reason why, he gives us four reasons why, which we looked at, is, first of all, because we've already, if you're a born-again Christian, the moment you were truly converted to Christ, you put off, you laid aside once and for all the old self with its evil practices. We're no longer the old flesh-ruled self. We're born into this world sinners by nature, but when we come to Christ, that has been... Uh, broken, the power of sin has been broken in our life, we can say no to fleshly lusts and desires, and we can say yes to the Holy Spirit and to this new self that we've now put on, which is the second reason that we see in verse 10, that those of us who have put on the new self are being renewed to a true knowledge according to the image of the one who created. We've already put on a new self. We're new creatures in Christ at the new birth. We're now a Holy Spirit ruled, not flesh ruled, but Holy Spirit ruled self. And this is who we are now. This is what we need to tell ourselves and know of ourselves that we are new creatures. We're a new self. And that's what should determine how we live now. And the third reason in verse 11 is that those of us who have put on the new self, of every true Christian, this eliminates, this reality eliminates all earthly grounds for division. It's a renewal in which there is no distinction between Greek and Jew, circumcised and uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave and free man, but Christ is all and in all. So all earthly, racial, uh, ceremonial, cultural, social grounds for discrimination, all those things that are raised up to cause relational barriers have all been knocked down and removed the moment you come to Christ and you put on the new self and your new creatures in Christ, that is what transcends all other identities and therefore becomes the basis for our loving and equal treatment of one another. And then there's the fourth reason of verse 12, the first part of verse 12. And that's because he says, he says, Beloved, as those who are chosen of God, 
holy and beloved. This is showing us that all Christians are equally chosen or equally elected by God, positionally holy and savingly loved. We didn't deserve any of that. We didn't deserve an eternity past to, to, to be chosen of God. We didn't deserve to be made holy in Christ. We didn't deserve to be set apart to be his own. We didn't deserve to have that special love bestowed upon us because we were sinners. And that theological reality is true for every single Christian. So what right then have, have we to reject one whom God has chosen? Well, what right have we to look down on one whom God has made holy positionally in Christ? And what right have we to withhold love from one whom God has loved in a special, saving, eternal way? In light of those reasons, now beginning in the second half of verse 12, all the way to the end of our passage of verse 15, we see the godly virtues that we are to put on, that we are to clothe ourselves with, that are more reflective of the new creatures that we have become in Christ. Ten virtues are listed here. But just like we saw in all the other lists in this uh, chapter, every one of these lists are written in the order that they are intended to be. This, these are haphazard. There's not just here and there. These virtues are intentionally listed in the order that they appear because there is a flow to them. And the flow here goes from attitudes of regard to actions of restraint and restoration. And the central concept between the attitudes and actions is humility. Humility. But the capstone, the capstone that is to permeate all of the virtues is love. That's why he says beyond all things, put on love. And then the goal effect is to have is to have a church where the peace of Christ rules and thanksgiving abounds. That's the flow here. And these are so important for us individually and as a church to really grasp and to illustrate their, their beauty and their power and their practical relevance. I'm going to be applying each one of these virtues to the matter of conflict resolution. Conflict resolution refers to the times when invariably we're going to have issues. Issues of disagreement, issues of uh, perhaps where we might feel offended and we want to make things right. How do we resolve that? That's what we're talking about. Now, if both parties in a conflict resolution come to the conflict with these virtues, well, you'll find that it will resolve the, the conflict much faster and far more effectively than any other thing. And it will actually result in a stronger bond as a result. And so it's important that we get our heads around these 10 virtues. And so to that end, in order to sort of help us remember, especially in the moment of conflict, uh, let's summarize these 10 virtues using the acronym CONFLICTS. All right, two S's there, but these will summarize the 10 conflict preventing relationship building virtues. You say, why is there two S's? Well, because life is filled with conflicts. Not just a conflict here or there, or occasions of conflicts, but conflicts pretty much happen to us every day, if not multiple times every day. Plus I needed another letter, so there you go. <laughs> So we're going to learn the first five principles today and then the remaining five next Sunday. Let's begin then with the C of conflicts. The first principle we are to put on, and there it is, verse 12, second half, put on a heart of compassion. This is interesting. It literally is put on bowels of compassion. Uh, now the bowels or the gut, in Hebrew mindset, was viewed as the seat of emotions. If you've uh, ever seen anyone bent over in grief and mourning, you can see why the Hebrews would associate the gut with the seat of emotion. And this is talking about a, a compassion that is truly heartfelt. This is one that 
endeavors to truly enter into another's shoes, to be able to rejoice with those who rejoice, weep with those who weep, is to feel what they feel. To the point, now listen, you know you have compassion when you are seeking to feel what they feel to the point that you are then driven to want to desire and to alleviate that hurt or that pain or that struggle. That's when compassion has truly reached its climax. We're moved to help. Now, this same kind of compassion is what characterized Jesus' earthly ministry. You see it over and over in the Gospels. He saw the crowd. He, was, he felt compassion for them. For example, Mark chapter 6, verse 34, he says, When Jesus went ashore, he saw a large crowd. He felt compassion for them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. And he began to teach them many things. You see, he saw their need. He felt their need. And then he was moved to then act to help resolve that need. That's compassion. The opposite of a heart of compassion would be callousness, just callousness, maybe looking down at uh, those who are hurting or ignoring their hurt or distancing yourself from their hurt. Well, let's apply this then to conflict resolution. Let's say someone approaches you uh, about something you did that, was, that offended them or that they have an issue of concern about you. How would a heart of compassion respond? Wouldn't a heart of compassion seek first and foremost to understand and to feel and to acknowledge the person's hurt? Wouldn't uh, a compassion have the desire to listen, to feel what they feel so that the person knows that, uh, that, that, that I've heard their concern and care about their concern? You see, it's easy when someone confronts you to become bitter about our own hurt or how a situation has affected us personally to the point that we can't even see the hurt that the other person has experienced. And what happens is if both parties come to the table calloused like that, only concerned about their own hurt, well, then you, get, you reach a relational gridlock, which just you can't move beyond. There's no way to resolve that. But the moment a Christ-like compassion enters the scene and seeks to see what the other person uh, feels, feel what they feel, and tries to alleviate that hurt and resolve that hurt, well, then you can see that that relational impasse can be broken. And resolution can begin. When you're faced with a conflict, the sea of compassion, let that be first. Feel what they feel. Well, then, let's look at the second virtue here. When, when our heart is truly filled with compassion, it will move us to want to seek their good. And that's the O of conflicts. There said by the word kindness, and here's the phrase, only seeking their good. Not only should we put on compassion, but secondly, we should only be seeking their good. That's the word kindness. Now, this word kindness, uh, its most basic root sense is simply to furnish what is needed. Furnish what is needed. To be useful, to be beneficial, to be helpful. It describes a, a good-natured, friendly disposition that is genuinely concerned about the other's good. And so therefore wants to show them good, do good to them, and even does so despite the fact that the person may deserve the complete opposite. They might be mean, they might be harsh, they might be rude, they might be ungrateful. But kindness still is good-natured. And only seeks their good. The perfect example of this is God himself. Kindness is one of the attributes of God. And we see this in Luke chapter 6, verse 35. Christ says this, Luke 6, 35. Love your enemies. Do good to them. Lend and expect nothing in return. 
and your reward will be great, and you will be sons of the Most High. In other words, you will reflect the very character of God, for he himself is kind. There's our word. For he himself is kind. And it says, to the ungrateful and evil people. So to be kind, like God is kind, is to seek their good, to do good to them, to lend and expect nothing in return, and to do so even to those who are ungrateful and even evil. This shows us, listen, this shows us that kindness doesn't depend on the other person's character. It depends on us. That's the issue. See, God doesn't call us to show kindness to others because they deserve it, but because God deserves it and because he wants us to reflect his character. You say, wow, that sounds impossible. Well, it is. It is in our own flesh and in our own self. But the good news is that kindness is one of the fruit of the Spirit. Galatians 5.22, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness. There's our word. If we walk in the Spirit, we can manifest and put on kindness. Let's apply that to conflict resolution then. Let's say, again, you're being confronted about something you did or said that uh, caused hurt. How would kindness respond to that? Well, kindness would care more about their good than protecting one's ego. Kindness We'll seek to maintain a friendly, a good-natured disposition toward that person, uh, endeavoring to be a blessing to that person, a balm to their hurt, rather than yielding to resentment or trying to blame shift or turning around. The kindness will want to make sure that as much as depends on it, they may know that I'm seeking their good, listening to them, caring about them, wanting things to be worked out so that they no longer feel that hurt, but are healed, relieved, and our relationship is restored. You see, kindness also has to work in the heart of the one doing the confronting. You see, kindness will only confront for the sake of the other's good, not out of spite, not out of pride, not out of self-righteousness, not out of vindictiveness. Kindness would confront in a friendly, good-natured way, not with sinful anger. You see how when we put on compassion and we put on kindness, and we are only seeking the good of others, how that can really heal and resolve conflict. But of course, for this kind of kindness and compassion to even be possible, one huge obstacle stands in the way, and that is me, the eye of pride. And that's why the, the next virtue is humility, which we can summarize with the phrase, the end of conflicts, as not me, but you first. Not me, but you first. That's humility. Now, this word actually was likely coined by Paul the Apostle himself. He, he, take, he took two words and then put them to, together to form a new word. The one word was humility or humble, lowliness. The other, thinking. And so it means lowly-minded, lowly-minded. So judge yourself as lowly. Now, the interesting thing about this word is it assumes that we tend to to exaggerate our view of ourselves. It assumes that we have an exaggerated view of our own self-sufficiency, our own self-importance, our own goodness, our own rightness, our own innocence, and that we tend to not only lift ourselves up too high, but we tend to minimize the good in others. But those who view themselves in light of God's standard and in light of the, the, the ever-deep, probing assessment of God who, who knows even the thoughts and intentions and motives of our heart, those who examine themselves in light of that, they're going to be lowly-minded. Despite however someone else might think of us, we know that before God, we're far worse than they could ever know. 
And see, those who are truly lowly minded won't be looking down on others. They'll be viewing others through in Christ's eyes. Probably the most definitive text on humility is Philippians 2. And uh, there we see in Philippians 2, verses 3 and 4, the definition and explanation of what humility is. He says, with humility of mind, there's our same word that we have here in Colossians. With humility of mind, regard one another as more important than yourself. Do not merely look out for your own personal interest, but also for the interest of others. You see, that's where we get the not me, but you first principle. Interestingly, though, this word, or at least the first word in this compound uh, word in the society of Paul's day, it was considered a shameful quality. It, it was viewed and used in a derogatory sense for, for something that was pitiful, something that was abject and servile. But when God the Son entered the scene and took on human flesh, he transformed that word of humility into one of the chief graces for all who would ever follow him. We see Christ as the perfect example of humility in Philippians chapter 2. This definitive text points to Jesus in verses 5 to 8 as the perfect example of humility. And he says this. Have this attitude in yourselves. In other words, think this way. This same way of thinking was also in Christ Jesus. It's a humble way of thinking. He says, who, although he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped. Now, this is a, a word that means to hold on with a closed, clenched fist. Not willing to, to open and let go. But God the Son, the second person of the Holy Trinity, didn't hold on to his divine rights and privileges with a closed, grass hand, but emptied himself, taking the form of a bondservant and being made in the likeness of men. Being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death. On a cross. You see, Christ, in becoming a man, and becoming a slave, and dying on the cross, he willingly gave up his divine rights and privileges and submitted himself to the Father. And so, what we see through this is that fundamental to humility is a willingness to give up our perceived rights and privileges. Now, think about this. Christ rights and privileges were actually actual rights and privileges. In fact, not just rights and privileges, they were the highest rights and privileges because they were the rights and privileges that were true of the divine triune God. But let's ask ourselves, what rights do we actually have before a holy, holy, holy God? Isn't it only to die and be condemned in hell for all eternity. That's what we have a right to. So any privileges short of that is ultimately undeserved. It's a grace. It's a, it's a mercy. So then why do we hold on so tenaciously to our presumed rights and privileges? Whatever rights and privileges we think we have, are nothing to be compared to the infinitely greater rights and privileges that Christ actually had as being God the Son. And yet he was willing to give up his rights and privileges. And therefore, what makes us think that we have any right to do anything less? Look, if you can grasp this, you'll be able to see how humility really is the fountainhead from which flow all the virtues that are listed before and after. The reason we often fail to show compassion and kindness to others is because we're so busy insisting on our rights that we have a right to ignore their feelings. We have a right only to prove that we're right and they're wrong and to get back at them. When we hold on to those presumed rights that we withhold 
gentleness and patience and forbearance and forgiveness and love because we say, I have a right to withhold it. But when we realize that those rights are really only presumed, that we don't actually have a right to those rights, and we're willing to let go of them, it actually frees us up to be compassionate, to seek only their good. Be gentle, patient, forbearing, forgiving, and loving. By the way, it's commonly said that if you know you're being humble, that you're not. You've heard that before, I'm sure. But biblically speaking, that's not true. It is possible, biblically speaking, to be humble and know when you're being humble. For example, Paul, he testified to the Ephesian elders in Acts 20, verse 19, that he had served the Lord among them with all humility. How could he say that to a group? Unless, of course, it was real. It was all humility, genuine humility. So it is possible to know. You know when you are considering others more important than yourselves. You know when you have an attitude that says, not me, but you first. Let's apply that then to conflict resolution. What would it look like? Well, when faced with a conflict, uh, what does pride do? The opposite. Well, pride actually blinds us from our own sinful judgment and harshness and demanding attitude. It's going to drive us to hold on to our perceived rights that were offended and we're going to say, hey, you know, uh, that person's got to make things right. And I demand this and demand that because my rights were infringed upon. But the humble, the humble is willing to give up those rights. The humble then, as a result, is able to take an objective look at things. When the humble are confronted or when they have to confront others, they don't do so out of a personal vendetta, but out of considering others more important than themselves. You see, that's what's going to allow you to seek only their good and to feel what they feel. When you're being confronted, if you're humble, well, then you're, you're going to not hold on to this presumed right that, hey, everyone's got to think of me more highly than I really am. And so I can't admit that I'm wrong. Instead, we are willing to yield them up and realize and own what we have done wrong. That's what a humble person does. And so often when there is a conflict that isn't resolved, almost invariably it's because of pride. So humility is so important. So those are the relationship-building attitudes that we are to put on. Now it moves toward the relationship-building actions. First are the actions of restraint in verses 12 and 13, and the actions of restoration in verses 14 and 15. So first of all, we must put on compassion. We must only seek their good and have a not me, but you first attitude. And now we have in verse 14, uh, the sorry, verse 12, uh, gentleness there, the F of conflicts. And that is friendly meekness. That's the word gentleness there. Friendly meekness. This word, interestingly, is a word that simply means to be friendly, mild-mannered, and self-controlled. It's the, the word of meekness. Meekness. And it particularly comes to the fore when someone wrongs you or rubs you the wrong way. Also, when you're dealing with the weakness of others. Gentleness must come to the fore. This friendly meekness. What does gentleness do? It takes people as they are. With all their faults, with all their failings, with all their flaws, without ever getting impatient or irritated or bitter or angry. You see, when gentleness is faced with insults or mistreatment, it chooses to respond with the meekness of a friend rather than the bitterness of an enemy. See, because friendly, meekness, gentleness, rather be injured than to injure others in return. You see, and when gentleness is working with the weakness of others, it seeks to accommodate 
to the person's weaknesses rather than being uncaring, harsh, and rude. So this gentle, self-controlled meekness is important to understand that it's not weakness. Meekness is not weakness, but it's strength under control. Meekness is not cowardly. It's not timid, but it's actually steel-like strength. This, this word actually was used in the Greek for a number of things, like a gentle breeze or a soothing medicine or a tamed lion. In each one of those cases, there's power, right? But it's power under control. A wind can easily become a tempest. Uh, too much medicine can easily hurt or, or kill. In a lion, well, a lion can easily turn and tear a person to pieces. But under control, these forces turn from a destructive force to a constructive one. So the virtue of gentleness really is to take the lion that is in us and submit it to the control of our Lord and Master Jesus Christ. And yes, just like the other virtues, it's a fruit of the Spirit. Galatians 5.23, so it is possible for us to live this way and to have that lion tamed by the Spirit of God. All right, so let's apply it to conflict resolution. Then. Let's say it becomes necessary, biblically speaking, for me to approach someone about a clear sin in their life. How would gentleness approach this? Well, it says in Galatians chapter 6, verse 1, Brethren, if anyone is caught in any trespass, in a clear violation, a clear sin, observable sin, you who are spiritual, restore such a one, here it is, in a spirit of gentleness. That's our same word, gentleness. Similarly, we see in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 24 and 25, that the Lord's bondservant must not be quarrelsome, but be kind to all, able to teach, patient when wrong, with gentleness, the same word, correcting those who are in opposition, if perhaps God may grant them repentance, leading to the knowledge of the truth. Gentleness. And it becomes particularly important when we need to Get involved in someone's life to help restore them who have sinned. Those who have perhaps even wrong thinking on some things. How do we bring the word of God to someone? How do we exercise gentleness? How do we manifest this friendly meekness? Well, one way to describe it is simply this. How would you like to be confronted by someone about a fault or flaw in your life? Right? You wouldn't want them to come with a spirit of retaliation. But you'd want to see that they're coming with a spirit of desire to restore, not to get back. You'd certainly want them to come in, in a self-denying, meek kind of way that says, you know, I struggle with sin just like you. I'm not better than you. Rather than coming with a self-righteous air, the gentleness. Is friendly meekness, the F of conflicts. Well, the next relationship building virtue, the L of conflicts, is the word long suffering. Long suffering. That's that word there, patience. Patience. Uh, now, look, in the Greek, there's a number of different words that are translated as patience. Uh, one major one is used to describe the patience that we ought to have for difficult circumstances. The other deals with how we are to be patient for difficult people. Well, which one do you think is in view here? Well, in the context of interpersonal relationships, it's patience toward difficult people. That's the word. This word is made up of two words put together, one for long and the other for suffering. Long suffering. It's to endure being wrong. It's to endure being mistreated, threatened, hurt, and to do so without a spirit of retaliation, without any bitterness, animosity, or anger allowed to sort of foam up and be bent up in our heart. Or the easiest way to describe long suffering is a stick of dynamite 
with a fuse that just goes on and on and on and on. Imagine when you are wronged or rubbed the wrong way, it's like the, the fuse is lit. But if that fuse is long, like all the way to the moon and back and beyond, I mean, it's going to take a long time before the dynamite ever blows up, right? That's the idea of long suffering. It's to never blow up on difficult people. Let me ask you, how long is your fuse? How long is your fuse? You say, well... <laughs> You don't live with the people I live with. Well, I understand. But you need to understand that a short fuse is not an indicator of the greatness of the offense committed against you. It really is exposing the weakness of character in you. You say, wow, what do I do? How do I have a longer fuse? Well, walk in the spirit. Put on long-suffering. This is also a fruit of the Spirit, Galatians 5.22. They're also translated as patience, long suffering, long fuse. So what about when it comes to conflict resolution? Well, think about it. Often in the midst of disagreements, struggles to get your concerns across, and uh, as conflict is being worked through, it's very common for our fuse to shorten. And for us to get frustrated and get upset and to get bitterness in our heart and anger to boil up inside us. But if we're willing to humble ourselves, give up our rights, get our eyes off of ourselves and onto the Lord, onto His Holy Spirit and dependence on Him, and to let the peace of Christ rule, and to let love reign and permeate our being, then you will find that the fuse will grow, especially in the time where there's conflict. The remaining qualities will help lengthen our fuse as well, but we're going to have to finish that next Lord's Day. But hopefully you can uh, begin to see how these principles really can prevent cabin fever conflict. So why don't, why don't we just all take a test, a personal test, each in our various homes, in our various contexts, let's see how long each of us can go. How many days, how many weeks can we go in this time of self-isolation? How long can we go without yielding to fleshly anger and wrath and malice and abuse of speech and impatience and all these things? And instead, be compassionate, seeking to feel what they feel and, and understand each other. and. Uh, to seek only the other's good, and to have a not me but you first attitude, and to keep cultivating that friendly meekness and long suffering. Let's see how long we can do that for. And just remember, remember that when cabin fever conflict provokes you to get fleshly, it's not the self isolation. Uh, don't blame it on the cabin fever. All that situation of the cabin fever does is bring out what's on the inside. Out of the heart, the mouth speaks. Let the Holy Spirit show you the old fleshly garments or accessories that you're still wearing that are inconsistent with who you truly are in Christ. So once you see it, you can remove it, repent of it, and replace it with the garments that reflect the new creature you already are in Christ. Or perhaps during this time, the Holy Spirit is going to show you that you're not just wearing old filthy clothes. You're still the old self. You're still that same person that you came out of the womb enslaved to sin. But now, now the Holy Spirit has helped you to see. You feel helpless. You feel the weight of your sin. You, you see your sin before the holy God and, and you realize that you need to be saved from your sins. Well, know this. If you confess with your mouth Jesus as Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, Romans 10 says you will be saved. For whoever will call on the name of the Lord will 
be saved. Maybe this is your day to do just that. Well, let's pray. Our Lord, we thank you for your holy word. It is challenging. Hearing these virtues, they're beautiful. Those of us who have the new heart, we, we know this resonates with us. We know this is the Christ-like way. Our hearts cry out that we want to live this way. We know very much the struggle with our flesh and that the flesh wars against the spirit. So at times we do things that we know that is wrong and we do not want to do them. We do the things we do not wish. Lord, bring us back to the cross. Bring us back to the gospel. Remind us again afresh of how Christ paid for all our sins once and for all. And Lord, let us forget those things which are behind. Repent of the sins and keep pressing on to that which lies ahead, that which we've been laid hold of, which is to be more like Christ. May we put on afresh these virtues. Lord, may you cultivate them in us. Lord, we desire to have compassion. We desire to only seek the other's good. We desire to have an attitude that says, not me, but you first, and, and that has friendly meekness and long-suffering. Lord, cultivate these in us, beginning in our individual lives, in our home, and then we're able to gather yet again in the future as a church may be manifested among us as an assembly. And Lord, if there's any here uh, listening online that uh, do not know you, that have come to recognize that this is just so far from their desires, that they are yet in their sin, Lord, I pray that you would help them to see that. They would call upon you and that you would save them, that they would see that you are uh, the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father but through you, that they would call upon you to be saved, and that you would save them, Lord. We just thank you for this time, and we pray that as we continue discussions, whether at home or on the phone or online through the chat, may, uh, may we be encouraged and may we see these virtues cultivated in our life more and more to the glory of Christ. In his name we pray. Amen.